My name is Dr. Pooja Agarwal. I'm a cognitive scientist. I've been conducting research on how students learn for 20 years, and I'm a classroom teacher. I'm a professor in Boston, Massachusetts in the United States. I teach about 200 college students about neuroscience and psychology every year. Um, so in my book, Powerful Teaching, I co-wrote it with a, a secondary school teacher. And we really wanted to make cognitive science applicable for teachers. There are a number of books available that I recommend on how memory works. It was important to us to take that research and help teachers understand what does that mean when you teach 20 students or 100 students or 300 students. So in our book, Powerful Teaching, and on my website, retrievalpractice.org, we really emphasize four principles of learning and four strategies based on those principles. The first one, retrieval practice. Practicing your knowledge helps you remember and learn. The second one is spacing, simply spacing out how students study over time. I teach music students. They can't just cram the night before they have a performance. Musicians know they have to practice over time. Spacing works the exact same way. So rather than covering a concept once and never coming back to it, we do need to revisit and retrieve that information with spacing. So that's the second strategy. The third one is called interleaving. It's just kind of mixing things up a little bit. If you think about a flashcard deck, it's taking the flashcards and shuffling them in order. Because otherwise, if students are learning a concept or let's say they're learning the history of World War I, we tend to remember concepts in a sequential order. With interleaving, if we mix it up, then students are able to compare and contrast. So for example, when students are learning addition and subtraction and division problems in math, if they only learn those step by step, they only know how to plug and chug. They only know this is an addition problem. This is a subtraction problem. But if we start mixing up the problems, then students have to ask, oh, is this an addition problem? Or is this a, a division problem? And they have to navigate that different strategy. So this interleaving, mixing up concepts students need to learn takes extra mental effort, but that helps them with their long-term learning. Another research-based principle is what we call metacognition. It's simply having students think about their own thinking. Oftentimes we ask students, tell me the answer to this question, tell me what you remember about mitosis and meiosis and cell division. With metacognition, research demonstrates if you ask students, how well do you think you understand that concept? Do you think you might forget that concept in the future? That thinking about learning process boosts their memory and long-term learning even more. So in our book, Powerful Teaching, we talk a lot about those four principles, the research behind it, but then simple changes teachers can make to use those strategies in their classroom. Yes, I've conducted research on uh, implementing retrieval practice in uh, secondary and university classrooms. And overwhelmingly, it's quite surprising that consistently when students engage in retrieval practice, their memory increases. So for example, when we give students little opportunities to retrieve using technology tools, using paper and pencil, when we give them that opportunity at the beginning of a school year, our research shows even nine months later that students remember that information even more. So we've conducted research with science classes, mathematics classes, history classes, young children, older adults, university students, any different types of schedules for retrieval practice. And my research over 20 years shows that retrieval practice consistently benefits students' learning. One idea we used to use as teachers is what's referred to as learning styles. If you've heard the phrase visual learner, auditory learner, kinesthetic learner, that's actually all a myth. It makes sense that we have learning preferences. I might enjoy listening to an audiobook, you might enjoy reading a book, 
What research has demonstrated in the past 20 years is actually learners learn best when they learn in a lot of different ways. So rather than someone only learning visually or feeling that they learn best when they listen, when we challenge students to watch YouTube videos, to listen to the audio, to engage in interactions and conversations, then student learning increases. For example, with the musicians I teach, if they're learning guitar, they can't just watch a YouTube video and they can't just listen to guitar music. They have to pick up the instrument and watch someone play and listen to the guitar music in order to learn best. So it makes sense that we might have these preferences or labels, but research demonstrates now that the best way to help students learn is to challenge them in a variety of ways. The knowledge is improved of how learning works in cognitive science, but there are a lot of gaps and a lot of work to be done. I'm very thankful for ICERI for bringing together people from 60 different countries, because when we imagine being able to share the science of learning with teachers and educators and leaders around the world, that's what we've been needing. For a long time, the research was only accessible in English, only accessible in the United States. On my website, retrievalpractice.org, I'm very excited to be sharing this research and practical teaching tips based on that research. So I think it's increasing our knowledge about how to teach effectively, and we have a lot of work left to do. The teachers I speak with get really engaged and excited about the rigorous scientific research uh, behind how their students learn and why our students keep forgetting. So it's very validating to know that there is a lot of research available and I find that teachers get excited that they already teach based on research of how we learn. So teachers are already using these methods that are backed by research. They may just not be aware of it. And then also I encounter a lot of teachers who are skeptical. Understandably, I teach college students. If someone tells me you should change your teaching and completely do it differently, I'm going to be a little hesitant. So I understand when teachers are also hesitant, which is why I try to emphasize that there's not only research on learning, but there are small, simple ways we can teach more effectively using this concept of retrieval practice. If students learn and students are retrieving what they learn, just like if I am retrieving Spanish and I'm practicing my Spanish or I'm practicing guitar, that's all pulling information out of our heads and it helps us learn. So even when teachers are learning about simple research-based principles, they know that they already use it and they get excited by the small little changes they can make in their classroom. When I was in university, when I was in college, I was starting uh, my college education as an elementary primary school teacher and I wanted to teach young children when I was taking those classes in college, I realized a lot of the methods they were teaching us about how to teach were all about anecdotes. My professors were talking to us about how they used to teach, and then that's how we should teach. There were no textbooks. It just felt very story-like, just sort of, this is what we've passed down in terms of how we should teach. And then as part of my college education, I started taking psychology classes. And I took a cognitive science class, and the whole class was about research on the science of learning. How we remember, how we forget, how we learn. And between those two sets of classes, I realized my education classes, they never talked about research. And in my research classes, they never talked about classroom teaching. And so for me, it just made sense to bridge the gap between the way we teach teachers and the way we conduct research about learning. So that's what got me really interested in both conducting research on how learning works, but then also applying it in the classroom and sharing it with teachers. Right. 
iSiri is fantastic. It really truly is one of the best conferences I have ever been to. And it's because of the knowledge that people are sharing about their classrooms and their teaching and the educational systems from 60 different countries around the world. I typically only get to attend conferences in the United States and being able to hear from teachers, I've already met teachers from Bulgaria and from Brazil and Lithuania, and there's no other conference I've ever been to where I've gotten to meet teachers from literally around the world. And so even just my experience at ICERI is really eye-opening because I get to learn a lot about how other systems work and how other teachers work. And we're forming collaborations. We're already getting in touch about conducting research in other parts of the world, about sharing our knowledge with other teachers from around the world. And even when I see teachers and educators attending the conference, building those connections with each other, it's just amazing to me that ICERI brings everyone together to do that.